Hey, everybody. Happy Friday night. Welcome to Banfield. I am about to lay out for you a, I don't think there's any way to sugarcoat it, a pretty frightening crime report. A woman, her male friend, and her three-year-old daughter were stabbed to death by her estranged husband who shot himself in the head. A 77-year-old man was shot in the face by a 26-year-old neighbor who had asked to mow the older man's yard but was refused. A man in his 50s fatally stabbed a female friend with an ice pick inside a parked SUV, supposedly because he wanted to know what it felt like to kill somebody. Brutal, premeditated murders just like the ones we hear about almost every day in almost every major city across the country. But these did not happen in major cities. They happened in Olney, Montana, population 113, and Kensett, Arkansas, population 1500, and Gresham, South Carolina, population 2700. Three small towns that mirror a problem in small towns all over the country. Crime is way up. The onset of COVID and the crime surge that came with it didn't just afflict our major population centers, though they all got the attention. Deadly violence surged in small town America too. The CDC reports that while homicide rates shot up 30% in metro areas in 2020, it rose almost as much, 25% in rural counties. That is the largest increase on record. The reasons may be different. Social isolation and lack of social services are being named by some people. Even lack of internet causing limited human contact even via Zoom. In a CDC survey, 12% of rural Americans reported starting to use or increasing their use of drugs or alcohol to cope with the pandemic. And small town policing is a huge job in the best of times with very few officers covering very big and often remote areas with relatively few resources. My guests know way too much about all of this. Sheriff Rick Singleton is the sheriff of Lauderdale County, Alabama. And also Chief Cameron Biddings is the acting chief of police in Harvey, Illinois. And we'll be joined hopefully shortly by Sheriff Dave Wedding of Evansville, Indiana. Um, welcome gentlemen. I wanna just start with uh, some of the, I mean, some of the statistics cause it's a little hard to sort of digest this. And I'll start with you if I can, Sheriff Singleton. Uh, the most dangerous counties have been listed, and I'll give you the, the list in order, as Bighorn County, Montana, Calhoun County, um, Missouri, and Baltimore County, Maryland. It's sort of hard to hear that list and not think it's like not the counties where New York and LA or Chicago are. What do you make of that? Well, you know, small uh, communities have the same issue that large communities do. I mean, you know, it just don't happen as frequently. Uh, we've been very fortunate here in Florence, Florida County, the shows area of Northwest Alabama, that we have a very low crime rate when it comes to violent crimes. Uh, and we're blessed by that. But uh, it's not the case in every community. And anything that happens in a big city can happen in a small town. I mean, I guess so. It's just that it hasn't been like that in the U.S. We haven't really heard that these small towns uh, had such a spike in crime, and we're, we're setting some, some records. Let, let me read off another um, list of a couple of these statistics, which are surprising. Chief Biddings, um, the safest counties have been listed as Loudoun County in Virginia, and that is a, a suburb of Washington, D.C., strange, uh, Douglas County in Colorado, and that is a suburb of Denver, another big city, and Delaware County, Ohio, uh, and that is a Columbus suburb. So I, I'm sort of curious to get your thought on, on the, the suburbs being so safe in these big cities, but not the small towns, which we always thought if you're rural, it's going to be a lot safer to live there. Yep. You know, um, we just contributed to the, just the times of change. You know, what's really happening out here um, every day. You know, the pandemic did not help. Um, you know, people were in isolation. They weren't uh, a lot of human or interaction uh, where they were dealing with people. So, you know, it just it, it really hurt us. And I think, you know, the biggest thing moving forward with my city and my department is doing is we're looking for violence reduction measures. We're looking to try to utilize different resources, uh, whether it's, um, you know, crisis management teams or something along the lines of that to kind of come in and help us reduce these different crimes that are happening. 
So, you know, I just, I, you know, what does happen in a small town, we deal with some of the, the, the same issues that some of the major cities deal with. And, you know, the biggest thing for us is just to make sure that we're not forgotten when it comes to, you know, the federal government, just, you know, making sure they continue to, you know, look down on us and just don't forget about us because we do need their help. We do need, need their assistance because we're doing all we can to try to suppress this crime to make sure, you know, some of these uh, people that are out here getting hurt. Um, it just that never happens again. Right. So I want to bring in Sheriff Dave Wedding, who's uh, who's joined us. Uh, good to have you on board there, Sheriff. So there's another uh, list that we've been going over some lists just as we were getting your signal up. And one of the lists that also seemed quite surprising was the list of the safest metro areas in the U.S. And, and this one really surprised me. Topping the list is Boston, uh, followed by New York and then uh, followed by Provo, Utah. So here's what's strange, Sheriff Wedding. Uh, there's a big group of, of members of my own staff who live in New York City, and they have been reporting fairly regularly for the last two years how dangerous it seems in the city to walk around in Manhattan, how they actually fear getting on the subway, um, and there have been shootings on the subway, and that they think it's like the crack uh, era back in the, in the 80s. How do, you, how do you square up these numbers of the, these metro centers uh, being so safe when in fact they seem like they get all the headlines for crime? Well, first of all, I don't really believe in statistics. Oftentimes they can be skewed. Depends on who's gathering the data and putting the data and examining the data uh, for the research. No matter where you go in the United States, we're seeing violent crime and violent behavior, especially from the offenders that we deal with. Uh, our sheriff's office averages at least one pursuit a week in Evansville, Vanver County area. Our neighboring uh, sheriff's office uh, just had a deputy sheriff shot in the head uh, less than a year or so ago. And we've had uh, many shootings between police and suspects. So. Uh, violence is everywhere, and for somebody to try to gather statistical data that makes something look good or bad, I think that's an error. Well, regardless, uh, they still, you know, they still compile these numbers, you know, for a reason, just to sort of give us a picture of where we are. And and another surprising picture of that is the most dangerous metro areas, and they're not what you would think. Uh, Baltimore, Maryland, that tops the list, and that might be something people would consider, but Pine Bluff, uh, Arkansas, and Farmington, New Mexico, those just don't, don't seem like they, they seem very out of place. Uh, Sheriff Singleton, what do you think about that? Well, I think like Sheriff Wedding said, a lot of times it has to do with the statistics. Uh, you know, when you have a smaller population, uh, and you have a number of crimes, and the statistics are going to look higher as far as percentage per capita. Uh, when you've got several million people that live in the city, uh, you may have a thousand homicides, but statistically, it doesn't look as bad as ten homicides in a, in a population of ten thousand. So, you know, a, a lot of it uh, is just in how you interpret those numbers in the sheriff's city. So let's look at this. Um, this very interesting uh, statistic. New York and Massachusetts have some of the strictest gun laws, as we often hear politicians discuss some way in one way on that and others way in another. But according to these lists, they're considered the safest. I'm wondering, uh, Chief Fittings, if, they're, if these are anomalies, that the fact that New York and, and Massachusetts are, are considered safe, uh, given the fact that they've got these strict gun laws, because we hear oftentimes criticism that they're the most dangerous and they have the strict gun laws. Yeah, I mean, you really do hear that. Um, but I do know something, you know, I believe Mayor Adams in uh, New York City is working on is their gun violence prevention team and or their task force, I'm sorry, it's a gun violence prevention task force where they're working on, um, you know, preventing these types of crimes from happening, you know, and being proactive versus being react. So that's something, you know, that I think it's uh, great to, that we can try to implement even in our smaller towns, because like the uh, sheriff said, you know, I really don't believe in the statistics as well, you know, because they, they can be screwed. So I just really feel like, you know, trying to come up with these innovative ideas and innovative ways to suppress this crime is just the, the, the new wave of policing. And that's just kind of what we need to do. You know, we need to bring, sit down at the table, bring our heads together, try to come up with something to, you know, to stop these crimes from happening in our communities, whether it's big or small. Whether your town is, you know, a population of the size of Chicago or something like the city of Harvey, where we're 25,000.
So I'm going to direct our viewers to take a look at the uh, Washington Post and New York Times who compiled uh, all those statistics. They can have a read through and then do their own interpretation of what the numbers mean. And in the meantime, Sheriff Wedding, tell me what you think the big issues are in, in your community in, in Indiana. What, what do you see as the issue that, that plagues you most and bedevils you? Well, I think not only my county, but across the United States, we, we always talk about law enforcement and, and increasing public safety and taking criminals off the street, but then the conversation stops. What we have to deal with is what do we do with these people when they're arrested? In our community, we release over 85% of our criminals that are under arrest within 48 hours. They're back out on the street, and I'm sure that number is similar across the United States. Many people commit crimes over and over again, and, and a lot of people say we just keep violent felons in custody, and, but we don't talk about nuisance criminals who go out and commit theft, burglary, sell drugs, and things like that, that need to stay in jail, and we need to build larger institutions to hold these people, and at the same time, try to have case managers and people to work with the offenders to figure out what's the root of the problem. Oftentimes they try to dump the correction measure into the sheriff's lap. And that, that's not our job to correct the behavior. Our jobs go out and keep our community safe and then to incarcerate people and hold until the courts establish the disposition of their case. But in, in five year period, we arrested 45,000 people in our community. And I'm telling you, we've released probably 85 to 90% of those people rapidly, which meant we only kept the balance of about 700 pretrial detainees at any one time, which I don't think that serves the public adequately. I know that's maddening for a lot of people. You know, we covered the story of the um, of the recall election and the backlash in California just on Tuesday's primaries of the get soft on crime uh, DAs and that sort of philosophy. Um, and there's been a lot of criticism of that. I'm wondering, Sheriff Singleton, if, if you have the, the same feelings as Sheriff Wedding does with regard to the the release of many of these um, these offenders, whether it's pre-trial or whether it's uh, no trial at all, then no prosecution at all. Well, we do. It's, uh, you know, of course, the person has a constitutional right to bail, uh, and most of them do bail out. But the last couple of years have especially been difficult for us because of the COVID. Uh, you know, we worked hard to try to keep COVID under control in our facility uh, because when someone comes down with an illness or, or is injured in the jail, then the citizens are the ones who foot the bill for the hospital stay. And, uh, you know, one COVID case could have wiped our entire annual budget out as far as medical service for our inmates. Uh, but it is a, a revolving door. It's the same people in and out uh, constantly. And, you know, the, the, the problem is they're not getting the services where they can become productive citizens. We, 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 our jails, uh, again, probably across the country, are the biggest mental health institutions in the country. Uh, several of our inmates have mental health issues. We do not. We're not equipped for it. We're not trained for it. Uh, we don't have the services that they need. And the last place they need to be is in jail. Uh, but that's the only option right now for, for a lot of people who have mental illnesses. So Chief Biddings, weigh in on that, uh, because a lot of people have pointed to, to two years of COVID and all the ensuing issues that, you know, the collapse of family finances, the social interaction, the frustrations, the, the political angst, and then just the fear of, of getting sick as well as changing the dynamic of how we are as social animals. Do you, um, do you buy into that? Do you think that this spike has a lot to do with the pandemic? I do. I mean, I, I really do. But... You know, also, you know, we just have to, like you said, to change that, the, the, the dynamic, we have to change, you know, our method of policing. Like the sheriff was saying, you know, with these crisis management teams and these mental health professionals that can assist our officers on calls, because we know that, you know, you know, our police officers don't know how to respond to some of these certain mental health calls. Yeah, we're sending them to the CIT uh, training and different trainings of that sort. But, you know, some of those professionals that are, you know, that they that specialize in mental health or opioid overdose response can come on scene and assist our officers and be able to say, okay, we don't need to incarcerate, incarcerate. We need to try to rehabilitate and try to get these people the help that they need. Because 
uh, they are repeat offenders. Most of the people that we come in contact with on a day to day basis. But I, I, you know, I continue to stress that the crisis management team working in tandem with our police department, with some of these other grassroots organizations um, is definitely for me the way to go and what we're trying to do in our community. Sheriff Whiting, weigh in on that issue of, of the, the drug, drug epidemic, because we have been reporting for years now that it is a crisis in a lot of rural communities. And, and we're also seeing this commensurate spike in crime. Do you see the drug epidemic as the, the chief motivator here in the, in the numbers in crime? I would rank it very high in uh, the rising crime and the violent crime, the overdose deaths, the suicides the assaults on police, uh, the resisting law enforcement crimes. Uh, we've had a significant rise in overdose deaths over the past several years, all those are opioid related. Uh, and now fentanyl deaths are at an all time high. And once again, we need to severely punish the drug dealer and at the same time try to find help for the drug addicts because I see people and their families that are hurting so bad uh, when they have a, a son or a daughter or, or an other relative that, I mean, they're hooked on drugs. They can't break the cycle. And we don't have the remedy in our jails to break that cycle. We only hold them only to release them to return to their behavior. When they build a jail, they always try to build it on the smallest footprint with the cheapest amount of money that they can afford to incarcerate people, that they lump them in there. Even we've got all this COVID money, and I asked to use some COVID money to put a special wing on our jail, just so we could quarantine people if we had a future pandemic, uh, just to help separate some drug addicts. And, and I got a resounding no for the COVID use. And I know they're using that money for a lot of things that's not earmarked for. But when law enforcement reaches out over and over begging for help, we get a deaf ear from our legislators, whether it be state or federal. It's been a rough two years since, you know, the George Floyd uh, protests and a lot of uh, defund the police activity out there in the streets and, and a lot of legislators who have actually done that and pulled back on police budgets, et cetera. So, uh, Sheriff Singleton, let me ask you this. Uh, there's the COVID story, and I didn't even mention the fact that, you know, not as many people were going to church and, and, and meeting in cafes or, you know, having family gatherings. So that sort of added to the, you know, desocialization of people as well. But what about that notion that, that you know, there was a real uh, war on the police for these last two years? Do you think that has had a profound effect on the crime? Well, I think it has. We, uh, we, for the first time, we have uh, three or four openings right now for deputy sheriffs, and that's pretty much unheard of. And, and the recruiting is, is a real challenge. Uh, it's harder to find young men and women who want to enter this profession with all the negative uh, hype about defund the police. And uh, even though in our particular situation, we're not dealing with that locally, we have a very supportive Camille County Commission, very supportive of our sheriff's office. But still, when, when you turn on the national news and that's all you see and hear, it takes an emotional toll on our people. Uh, even though we're not directly dealing with it, we are, in a sense, indirectly dealing with it on an emotional level. So uh, it, it, it's a real challenge. And recruiting and retention is, uh, I've had two, three deputies retire early because of, the, of you know, they're just, they're just burnt out. You know, they're, they're tired of hearing it. Well, I'm praying for all three of you and for all the men and women out there in uniform who are serving and trying to, you know, get this under control. It is a hell of a job, and you also don't get thanked enough for it. Thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.